Most professions have mottos that summarize a code of conduct that their practitioners are meant to live up to. Physicians have first, do no harm. Lawyers have justice is blind. Journalists, being full of words, have several, although I'm skeptical of most of them. Journalists speak truth to power. We don't. We ask questions of those in power and about one time in a hundred get an honest answer. Journalists afflict the comfortable and give comfort to the afflicted. If we do that at all, we've been doing rather a poor job of it. Over my lifetime, the comfortable have become even more cosseted, and the afflicted are more than ever on the outside. This may explain why there are tens of millions of refugees on the move around the planet trying to find a better life. But one claim of my profession I do take seriously is journalism is the first rough draft of history. You may have heard the expression as well. Philip Graham, the publisher of the Washington Post from 1946 to 1963, gets the credit for making the phrase popular. He probably borrowed it from a Post editorial writer. During World War II, the paper occasionally used a variation of the phrase in its editorials. Journalism is the first draft of history. Not rough. Media critic Jack Schaefer has found sources that trace the origin of the phrase to the state newspaper in Columbia, South Carolina. The date, December 5th, 1905. It was in a syndicated column by William Fitch advocating that reading a daily paper should be made part of the school curriculum. Fitch wrote, The newspapers are making, morning after morning, the rough draft of history. Later the historian will come, take down the old files, and transform the crude but sincere and accurate annals of editors and reporters into history, into literature. The modern school must study the daily newspaper. I suppose it's too late to take Fitch's advice. If schools had made daily newspaper reading a requirement, perhaps more papers would have survived to be drafts of history. A few months ago, I was in Ripley, Ohio, a river town an hour or so east of Cincinnati. I was making a documentary about the upcoming presidential election. I stopped into the library, Civil War cannon guarding the entrance, and spoke to the librarian about this and that. Either side of the heavy oak table where we were seated were bound copies, going back to the mid-19th century, of the various newspapers that had thrived at one time or another in Ripley. Almost all of them are defunct now. Ripley is a lovely town, but a dying one, and the contemporary history of the place and its struggles, who will know it? Writing history is a grand claim for journalists to make, especially at a time when our work is denigrated and professionalism questioned. William Fitch has it about right in his choice of adjectives to describe why what we can do can be a foundation for history, crude, but sincere and accurate. It's crude because there's never enough space, nor is there enough time to find all the right words to fully tell the story. It's sincere because you make an honest attempt to get the most important stuff before the reader or listener or viewer, and it's as accurate as you can make it because that's what distinguishes journalism from rumor-mongering the striving to be as accurate as possible. And those who find their way to your reporting should know that perfect accuracy is hard to achieve. New facts emerge. Body counts rise and fall. Anyway, history in all its forms is what the first rough draft of history, FRDH podcast, is about. It's a logical, inevitable step for me. I have always been obsessed with history, but I did not become a journalist to write its first draft. I got into the news business because I had run out of options. I had worked in the theater and public relations without great success in my 20s and lucked into a job as the oldest copy aide at the Washington Post shortly after my 30th birthday. I was assigned to the style section. I exploited my personal history and began contributing arts features. Nobody taught me or told me, but in every piece I did there was a line, a phrase, an illusion that provided historical context. I did it because no event comes out of nothing.
not even planes flying into skyscrapers in lower Manhattan. People need that line or two to understand why they should care about the news you are telling them. A decade later, living in London, reporting for NPR, Northern Ireland was on my beat. For several years, in early July, there were disturbances at Drum Cree, a hamlet on the outskirts of Portadown, disturbances that threatened to wreck the peace process. How could listeners understand why this violence was happening in 1995, 96, 97, unless they knew about how many Northern Irish Protestants died at the Battle of the Somme 80 years earlier, or why this same impasse was reached year after year? Most wars come out of disputed history. You're just writing a rough draft of the next chapter, and you can't do that without some reference to the history that has come before. The U.S. Army has a Center for Military History with an excellent searchable website. It grew out of a project called the Official Records of the Rebellion, set up in 1874 to write a military history of the Civil War. Sincere and accurate recounting of old campaigns is an important guide for officers planning for battle tomorrow. Today, Army historians debrief soldiers and their officers after every engagement. It's the Army's oral first draft of history. What reporters do is very similar. Often we get to the battlefield before the military historians. In some cases, we get to the battlefield before the Army. In Mosul, in April 2003, the day Saddam Hussein's regime evaporated, there was no American army. I assumed there were special forces and some armed CIA operatives in the shadows, but the most visible Americans were members of the press. In a place where all government authority had collapsed, I had a brief glimpse of the raw material of history being forged into a new shape on the site of one of history's first civilizations. Along the walls of ancient Nineveh, people were wandering in a daze. No one knew what was happening or what would happen next. Released from history, unable to walk towards the future, and the liberators were nowhere to guide them. Then history happened to me. I was laid off. I was not alone. Forty-five percent of editorial jobs at American newspapers have gone in the last quarter of a century. Foreman says these jobs are going, boys and they ain't coming back. I wrote a book about an Iraqi man who became my brother during the war, a dissident who survived Saddam Hussein's torture chambers, only to be murdered in the anarchy that followed the dictator's overthrow. It was a history of modern Iraq as one man and his family lived it. I wrote a book about the history of Europe's Jews in the century and a half after they were let out of the ghetto during the French Revolution and Napoleonic conquests until the Nazis took power in 1933. I thought about Philip Graham's first rough draft often as I researched emancipation. I read newspaper reports of political debates in Paris in 1789 and the Revolution of 1848 in Vienna. I needed to find out more about Marcel Proust's involvement with the Dreyfus Affair. Googling around, I came across an article from the New York Times in 1898. Proust was a prominent wealthy gay esthete, enjoying the pleasures of fin de siècle Paris, not yet a writer. His life was galvanized by the Dreyfus Affair. He organized a petition to get a new trial for Alfred Dreyfus. Among those he got to sign was Anatole France, one of the country's most prominent novelists. This caught the attention of the New York Times correspondent, whose story ended, Marcel Proust is probably the author of Marcel Prevost, or he may be Dr. Achille A. Proust, the well-known professor of hygiene and commander of the Legion of Honor. There is no prominent Frenchman by the name of Marcel Proust. Crude, sincere, and accurate. I can imagine the desk editor in New York sending cables to the reporter in Paris asking, who the hell is Marcel Proust? And the reporter cabling back, I don't know, there's a famous doctor called Proust, who was actually Marcel's father, but it's probably the writer Prevost, because there's no writer called Marcel Proust. And so that last paragraph made it into print and the historical record. But history doesn't stop. You know that nor do the ways in which people learn about history stay the same. Hence this podcast. <laughs>
And now for the FRDH mission statement. History keeps happening to me, even if I no longer get to the front line to watch it being made in its raw form. I want to tell you about it. Sometimes this podcast will be about events that have just happened, and it will try to place the news in a historical context. Sometimes it will be reflective about things that happened 30 years ago and that we can understand better now that the facts are completely established and the rough draft can be rewritten. You know, there really was a prominent Frenchman named Marcel Proust. Often this podcast will be about America, because America didn't get to be the way it is overnight, or because of the crash of 2008, or the failure of the Iraq War, or 9-11. America is coming to the end of an age of reaction, just as in 1973 it was coming to the end of the New Deal era. Some essays I've written on the subject are already streaming in the FRDH archive. Give a listen. I hope sometimes to talk about the news of the week with old colleagues who spent their lives writing the first rough draft of history, and occasionally I will simply testify about my life, about what it was like to be a child of victory, to grow up in the 50s and 60s, when everybody worked, racial injustice was finally put into retreat, and the culture changed. Finally, there's no room for jokes in a mission statement, but I hope to make you laugh, or at least snort in surprise at least once in every episode. Phil Graham called writing the first rough draft of history an inescapably impossible task, But that's no reason why FRDH can't be entertaining. So please, keep listening.